Lord, we pray for your healing touch throughout this earth. We thank you for this week of wow, a week of worship and adventure in Jesus Christ. We pray, Father, that something was said or heard this week that would encourage someone's spirit, would lift up someone bowed down head, that would drive demons to their proper place and bring the Holy Spirit into the presence of your people. Forgive us our sin, create within us clean hearts, renew within us the right spirit that we might be used by you, O oh God, for you are the source of our strength and the strength of our life. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, and somebody shout, amen. You are my strength. Just play that. Like no other. Strength like no other. But it's still sunshine in our hearts. Amen. It's a little snow out there. Be careful. But we know that God is able to carry and keep us through. I want to thank you all of you who are participating this week 
and these series of services to help us make our, our path brighter and our load lighter. And we're grateful for you and all that you have done to make this week a week that's about the Prince of Peace and his people. The Prince of Peace and his people. It's not about me, it's not about you, but it's about Jesus Christ. And we want to make his name popular, famous, great in all the nation. We want to put God on blast this week. Let the world know that God is still our strong tower and that he has all power. And I know there's vicissitudes of violence and uh, so many vulnerable moments in our present, current day and age. People are struggling and suffering left to right. But yet God has all power. And if you continue to pray, God will help those who are willing to help even themselves through prayer and through perseverance and through the process of pushing toward his goodness. Amen. Well, I've got a word today, and I don't want to bore you or hold you long, but that's a lot for me to say because we made it to Marty Thursday, and today is Marty Thursday, and in the life and history of Christians everywhere, we celebrate Marty Thursday as being that preclude, that prelude uh, before Calvary. It's the entrance into the point where Jesus has his focus and his attention on his mission and on his cause as the redeemer, the reacher, the righteous one, the one who was slain before the foundation of the world. So today we grow closer to Calvary just within 24 hours. Jesus will be crucified on the cross of Calvary. He will become sin for us. This morning Thursday will be filled with both blessing and betrayal as Jesus and the disciples observe the Passover and as the Passover is commemoration of the covering and the flight and the remembrance of rescue. The Bible says in Luke chapter 22 verse 19, and he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. As we look at Marty Thursday, this Holy Thursday of Passion Week before Easter commemorates the events that we note through the history and the legacy of God's Jewish people. But then we note that Jesus institutes some new inauguratory divine spiritual practices that we must all obey and display. He gives uh, the last supper. He washes the disciples' feet. He observes the Passover, the Passage, or the Seder meal. And then we find in Exodus chapter 12, when uh, he tells his people that you shall always commemorate the Passover. You shall always remember that when you cried out, I answered your cry. And when you needed me, I showed up right in the nick of time. And when you didn't know how you were going to make it, I rescued you from the brickyard and the anguish and the agony of Egypt. And the people had to cook that meal, and they had to cook it the way God says prepare it. They had to burn it the way God says burn it. They had to eat it the way God said eat it. And they had to move the way God said move. Some of us can't get to where God wants us to be because we're not moving when he says move. But as they ate this divine, holy symbol of a Seder meal, and they would lay out the the food thereof, and they would take it, and they would partake of it. They had to take flight or with that flight, knowing that it represents the covering of the death angel that passed over God's people. God did tell them back in Egypt that you are to put blood on the doorpost of your house. And if you have the blood on your house, when the deaf angel shows up, the problem wouldn't be with Diabolos or the devil or the evil one or the enemy or the ugly one. Your problem will be with me if you don't have blood on your post. So then the enemy is not our greatest challenge, our, our greatest problem, our greatest issue, but God can be our biggest problem 
if we don't let him come into the room, if we don't allow him in our hearts, if we don't allow him to be a part of what he's speaking to us. So God says, make sure that you have the blood on your doorpost. Do you have the blood on your post? Have you been covered under the blood of Jesus? Marty Thursday is a day filled and packed with events. And the thing I like about Marty Thursday is when Jesus rises from the supper table and he takes off his garments and he wraps himself in a towel and then he begins to take that towel and wash the disciples' feet. John chapter 13, verse 1 through 6. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come and that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which was in the world, he loved them unto the end. And he still loves you until the end. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he was come from God and went back to God, he rise from the supper table. He laid aside his garments. He took a towel and girded himself. After that, he poured water in a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with a towel wherewith he was girded. Then cometh he to Simon Peter and Peter said unto him, Lord, does thou wash my feet? Simon had a problem getting his feet washed by Jesus. And there's a, whole, a lot of people that that's a, uh, have a problem being washed by Jesus, being touched by Jesus, being cleansed, being healed, being delivered by Jesus. Peter said, I know about your magnificence and your majesty, your might, and I know about your power and your preeminence. You can't wash my feet. Let me wash your feet. But Jesus goes on to say, if I don't fellowship with you in the washing of feet, you cannot fellowship with me in the kingdom. And so I discovered, Brother Hakeem, that the washing of the feet portrayed three things. First of all, a holy work. The Bible did say that he rose from the supper table. He rose from the supper table. That's a picture of Jesus leaving uh, his royal seat in glory, coming down through the annuals and decades and centuries and, and thousand years of time and coming down and walking in the form of humanity. He comes down, he takes off his royal position and he takes off his godly position and his divine position and he puts on the creature, he puts on the man, he puts on humanity, he was 100% God, 100% man, he was impeccable, that means he could not sin because he would not sin, he would not sin because he could not sin, he was perfect, he walked in faith, he walked in wisdom and stature and here Jesus puts on humanity and he puts on the form of a servant and being found in the form of a servant he humbled himself and became obedient even unto the cross that speaks about the holy work of Jesus that Jesus shows them that I came down here to do the work that I came to do and whatever you do beloved do the work that Jesus have called you to do. You can't do nobody else's work. You got to do your work. The anointing is not gonna come with somebody else's work. It's gonna come with your work. Jesus was the anointed one who had the anointing, Jesus Christ. But not only that, it was a holy wash. The washing of the feet, the word translated wash in John 13, five and six, eight and 12, and 14 is the word niptu. Niptu means to wash part of the body, just part of the body. But by the time he mentions to Peter, unless you are washed, it's a different word, lu, which means to be bathed all over. Jesus said, not only am I here to wash your feet, symbolizing humility for humanity, but he says, I also came to cleanse your whole body, amen, so that you can be anointed and not annoyance. So you can be cleansed and covered and not corrupted. Yeah. Jesus said, you have been made clean by my word. 
And it's the word that washes us. And on this morning, Thursday, you ought to thank God that you've been washed in blood and covered under the blood of Jesus. It's a holy work. It's a holy wash and it's a holy walk. To bathe all over, the distinction is important. For Jesus was trying to teach his disciples the importance of a holy walk. Now that you got your holy wash, you ought to have a holy walk. Now that you've been cleansed, you ought to have your conduct. You ought to have your doctrine with your duty. You ought to have your message with your mannerism. And so he says, I've got to wash your whole body. Here's a picture of Jesus rising from his royal seat, going down through the time, generations, and coming down as a servant with humility to serve. I wish I had time to talk about how humility, I deem, is a blessing. Yeah. How when you're humble, if you humble yourself, God will exalt you yeah. in due time. And God resists the proud, but he gives place and favor to those who are humble. God wants us to walk in humility. He wants us to talk in humility. Jesus is the epitome of humility. Jesus is the example of humility. Philippians chapter 2 says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who thought it not robbery to be equal with God, made himself of no reputation, humbled himself. And became obedient as a servant, even unto the cross. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Give me a few more minutes and I'm going to let you go. That Jesus here in this morning Thursday, he comes in. It was the day in which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. So Jesus sent Peter and John to the city to prepare the Passover meal. Jesus told Peter and John that when they entered the city, that they would meet a man carrying a jar of water. He instructed them to follow the man in the house and prepare the upper room of the house for the meal. Write those scriptures down there in Matthew's chapter 26, Mark chapter 14, and Luke chapter 22. The Passover lamb was to be sacrificed. And here they are about to eat a physical meal, but Jesus know that there is a spiritual connection toward that meal. Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, offered to lead the chief priests and scribes to Jesus when no crowd was present. You always got a Judas in the crowd. I don't have time to deal with Judas. But one thing we can understand, let me pause here and tell you, you can, you can understand about Judas is that the fact that Jesus teaches us how to deal with our Judases. I said he teaches us how to deal with our Judas. If Jesus can have patience with Judas, so can you and I have patience with Judas. You know, Judas had a persistent, angry activity and attitude toward the woman with the alabaster box who broke it and poured it on Jesus' feet and washed his feet with her hair. And it was uh, Judas with that persistent anger, always angry about what could be put in the treasure rather than that which was treasured. Yeah, yeah. Judas, Jesus teaches us how to deal with Judas. He teaches us that we're going to have some Judases. And so Judas, he makes a pact with the enemies. The pact with Judas was just with just what the enemies wanted to get Jesus. The chief priests and the elders were pleased with Judas's plan and offered him 30 pieces of silver to betray Jesus. And Jesus foretold his betrayal and demise calls and inquiries amongst the disciples. He said, one of you will betray me. And they began to look at each other and say, is it I, is it I, is it I? Jesus then tell Judas to go and make haste, make your move, go ahead and do what you're gonna do. But whatever you're gonna do, do it quickly. He tells Judas, I want you to go on about your business and go ahead because Jesus knew things from afar off. Aren't you glad you serve a Savior who already knows what's around your bend, what's around your corner? And oftentimes we celebrate what did happen to us, all the blessings that happened to us, all of the blessings.
blessings and all of the, the things of happiness and joy and deliverance. But let me tell you, you ought to thank God sometimes for what didn't happen to you that you don't even know nothing about. God has a way of seeing around our beings and he teaches us how to deal with Judas. I'm just lecturing here. Judas's will always be around. But on this morning Thursday, the Last Supper is instituted. At the meal, Jesus told his disciples he would not eat bread or drink wine until the day when he eats and drinks it with them in the kingdom. Then Jesus took the bread, gave thanks, broke it, and said, this is my body which is given for you. He then took the cup and said, this is the blood of the new covenant shared for the forgiveness of your sins. He told them that whenever they ate the bread or drank the cup, they'll do it in remembrance of his preeminence and his power and his plan and his purpose, but more importantly, in the death and burial of Jesus until he comes again. Doesn't matter how many times you do it. Some institutes it and inaugurates it every Sunday. Some has it once a month. Some takes it every quarter or once a year. But whatever you do, you ought to observe the Lord's Supper. The body that was broken, the blood that was shed, the body that was broken for us when he was speared in the side and that centurion soldier, Roman soldier looked up and said, surely blood and water is pouring out blood for redemption, water for baptism. He said, surely he must be the son of God. Am I talking to somebody here? You ought to thank God for the authenticity of Jesus. You ought to thank God for the validity of Jesus. In the midst of the scrutiny of Jesus, you ought to thank God for the genuineness of Jesus. Yeah, yeah. My God. And so he institutes the Lord's Supper. And after the dinner, as they were finishing, Jesus told his disciples, the greatest commandment, this commandment I give unto you, that you love one another as I have loved you. People will recognize that you are my disciples by the love that you have one for another. Yeah. Before they left the Mount of Olives, Jesus told his disciples to find a bag and a sword. And the disciples said they had two swords, which was enough to fulfill the scriptures that says that Jesus was among the lawless. Jesus ran with some rough fellas. He ran with some tough people, but he was the one who was able. That's why the church, I believe, Akeem, has to get in the place of not being so high that we cannot come down and minister to all people for everybody who names and claims and holds and cleans to the cross of Jesus are at the same level at the foot of the cross. All of us come to the cross. Nothing in our hands we bring. Holding to the cross, we cling. We're at the foot of the cross of Jesus. That's why you can pray for your enemies. That's why you can love the unlovable. That's why you can go when you feel like quitting. That's why you can keep on moving when it seems like the world has you on stationary. And you can keep looking up when folk try to put you down. It's because everybody's at the foot of the cross. My goodness. And so he says here that Jesus anoints them, but Jesus is anointed. Now watch what happens here. Jesus is giving the Passover meal indicative of him becoming the Passover lamb. For he eats the Passover meal on Thursday. He becomes the Passover lamb on Good Friday. And there was a woman in the crowd, some to believe it, to be married, the sister of Martha. Many have tried to figure out which Mary this was, but I believe it to be the one who was always hanging around Jesus' feet. Even when Martha was busy working, she was busy worshiping. When Martha was busy being busy, she was busy being blessed. And Mary comes and, um, and she anoints the feet of Jesus. Matthew chapter 26, verse 13. 
Verily I say unto you, whosoever or wheresoever this gospel shall be preached, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached, the whole world, in this world, there shall also be mentioned this woman and what she has done. Yeah. It shall be for a memorial unto her yeah. that wherever and whenever you talk about these days that dwindle down in my passion week, that you would always remember that this woman came with an alabaster box that was filled with spikenard ointment and that she broke that box and she poured it and as it went down, she anointed my feet with her hair. Here he says, it shall be for an everlasting memorial of what this woman have done in my life. Well, Jesus here is the perfect example of our sin covering. He prepares the path to Calvary and these Thursday thoughts, we remember how Jesus predicts Peter's denial. Yeah. Jesus promises the Holy Spirit. He, when he shall come, he shall bring you into remembrance of all the things that I have taught you. And he shall be your comforter. Jesus proclaims peace for those who abide in him. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, he says you shall have peace in this world. You will not have any peace. But the peace that I give is not as the world giveth. That's why you can be broke in your pocket, but you can be rich in your spirit. That's why you don't have to have a lot of lights and fanfare on your page, but you can thank God for the angelic host who is able to be a witness of your testimony. He proclaims peace of those who abide with him. And then Jesus pronounces the paracletos or the paraclete, a mis-persecution. That while you are being persecuted, while you are being lied on, while you are being scandalized, while you are being talked about, while your name being drugged through the mud, while your name is being planted on billboards and, and on social media, that you got the paraclete, you got the power of the Holy Spirit to keep you and govern you in the midst of your trials. Jesus, not only that, he promoted prayer. And he prayed to the Father. And he said, if you pray in my name, it's like writing a check that's already been signed. The Father hears the prayers that are in the name of Jesus. Somebody talk back to me here. Jesus, not only that, he predicts the hour of his death. Nobody knew when he would die, just like nobody knew or knows when he's coming back again. But he predicts the hour of his death. And then he prepares to become the Passover lamb. Well, I've got to bid you a good afternoon. Get ready for tonight's service. But I want to tell you that I thank God for Monday Thursday. Because Jesus paid it all, and all to him we owe. Sin left a crimson stain, and he washed it white as snow. Somebody ought to be a living witness to say, I heard the voice of Jesus say, come on to me and rest. Lie down, thou weary one, lie down, thy head upon my breast. And so I came to Jesus just as I was. I was weary.
up against the authority and the capability of Jesus and we bring into captivity those thoughts and those things that will bless us and lift us and give us favor and give us his grace. Somebody say amen. 